Welcome to the Cultivating Health Equity Stories podcast. In this captivating series, we delve into the heart of health equity, sharing stories that illuminate the path toward a fairer, more inclusive healthcare landscape. Our mission is to amplify voices, challenge norms, and inspire change. Here is your host, Dr. Troy Campbell, a research scientist on health equity issues. During the first round with cancer, I had a lot of people say like, you're such an inspiration. You're so great. God only gives, you know, his strongest, you know, I really hate that saying, by the way, but that was more like I was an inspiration and I kind of went along with that. And maybe that helped me survive the first time around. The second time around, I'm like, I remember actually being in this, this actual room that I'm in now. And I remember crying and screaming and angry at God. Like I did everything why are you going to do this again to my oldest son and now to my my three-month-old son like i i did this i did that and it was just like angry and i think everything that i was raised with with the word of faith and and um being the good christian and how it was just completely gone that idea and so i lost my innocence in a different way so the first time it was more about my mortality the second time was everything that I believed about higher power and all of that was completely like, it doesn't mean anything. And so the second time around is when I was really depressed. I was, it was very hard for me. And also because I knew what was going to happen. I knew the chemo. I knew what, what I was going to start feeling. And it wasn't until later that I understood that before a transplant, you get like the atomic bomb of chemos. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the PAs described it to me that usually when you, it's like you're a tree and when you have chemo, it's like you, you chop off the tree, but the trunk is still there. But with transplant, they want to take the tree out from the root. So they have to like completely annihilate everything. And of course that, that is pretty much what I felt in, in my spiritual, my mental, my physical, everything. And since I was in the hospital longer, a lot more things happen, a lot more times that I almost thought I didn't make, I wouldn't make it. Yeah. It was a lot harder, a lot harder, like I think 10 times harder than the first time. And that's So when, when did you my... make a turning point mentally? After, after my transplant and after treatment, I was in the hospital for 30 something days. Right. What after I got out is when I I fell into a deep depression. And there's a lot of reasons. So when I had chemo and I had full body radiation, my skin actually burned and uh, I would have extreme pain. So I got lots and lots of Dilaudid, which is a very powerful opioid. And I even had like a little switch where I could, you know, get you more. Yeah. And so I would get high amounts of it right because i needed it but when i got to when i got out of the hospital to just go every day for transfusions and things like that uh of course i became addicted you know it was 2011 2012 at the time and so the opioid crisis was in full swing and so now in retrospect i realized that my body became dependent of it and but i was I was almost, I went into depression, especially towards the end of my treatment when I was getting, when I was recovering, because I started thinking, I think it's kind of what postpartum depression Mm -hmm. feels like where I actually felt that me being on earth would cause more harm to my children and my husband than being alive. Right. And so that's the time when I was going to a psychiatrist at MD Anderson. They have specific psychiatrists for cancer uh, survivors. And they were giving me all these medication, benzodiazepams, you know, just trying to figure out how to help my mental state. But I think it also, sorry if I'm jumping around because no, I'm, no, no, I'm no. remembering these you. things. So, your yeah. uh, so after the Dilaudid and I came home, they gave me pills, but it's not the same as intravenous. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now I understand it was withdrawal, so I wouldn't sleep. And at one time I didn't sleep for three days mm-hmm. and I became also almost like psychotic. At least that's what the psychiatrist saw. And that's why I had like emergency kind of psychiatry and all that stuff. 
So they would give me different medications. So then I knew that whenever I would get the pain medicine when I was in the hospital and I was just completely, just completely exhausted and completely overwhelmed with pain, I knew that that medication, Dilaudid, would be something that would give me a break. Yeah. And not just a break from my pain, but a break from my mental, mental yeah, strain. Yeah. Mental strain. Yeah. And so, of course, now that I'm having all these benzodiazepams and opioids, I had many. And so that's when I started overdosing. Wow. And it was hard because I got judged a lot. Like you, you had a successful transplant. Why are you doing this? Why are you, how could you do this to your kids? But now I'm able to articulate better that when you're in that state of mind, having huge financial debt, debt. Um, the, the transplant itself with the cord blood and everything was a million dollar package. Mm -hmm. And I had Cobra. And the first time I got sick, it was $800 a month plus a $10,000 deductible. The second time it was $1,000 a month. And if it wasn't for my family contributing, I I, I wouldn't be able to get the treatment. So, you, so you, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Oh. No, so, it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot. I know. And it's, uh, my point is you were starting to think, and I'm not a mental health expert, but you were starting to think that you were more for a cost. Than, than a benefit to your family. I, I see where you were going down that path, right? And that, that yes. is a mental challenge right there. Yeah. And I think that's what women feel with postpartum depression. Right. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's very real because you actually do believe that. And so after overdosing three times, I actually went to the hospital. Then, you know, they were able to take away all the medications. And so then I, I became almost like, it got worse. Yeah. I mean, not that the taking the medication was helpful, but it actually got worse in my pursuit yeah, for it. Of, of, in my way, mending what I had done. Like I had put my family through this. Yeah. And so the last time I tried to take, you know, in my life, I actually, my, my baby, my youngest was two years old and my oldest was in school. And so I would usually pick them up from school. But what I did that day is, is I just felt like, okay, I'm done. I don't know what, it was just, everything just seemed like closing in. So I went to go drop off my son at my mom's house. And thankfully my aunt looked at me like something was wrong and actually told my mom. But I went back home and I turned on, I, the garage was closed and I turned on the car and I was just happy. I was elated, you know, trying to end my life because I thought I was doing the best thing. Best thing, for your, then, best thing for your family at the time, right? And so what happened, what changed everything is I thought, my son is going to get out of school and I'm not going to be there. And I started thinking like, it's going to cause him trauma that every time somebody's late. Right, yeah. And so I said, I'm going to cause my son to have trauma that anytime somebody's late, he's going to think somebody died because his mother died. And that was the moment that I said, okay, I can't do this. Now that's when everything just turned on. And I realized like, it's better for me to be with my kids. Like I was able to kind of get, get rid of that thinking. And that's when things started to change. And that's when I started, you know, kind of going back and to the things that I love, you know, kind of seeing my life outside of cancer, outside of the illness, outside of all of this. And um, that's when my road to recovery, mental yeah, right. uh, recovery started. Yeah. So, so you, you start to reflect about your, your children, your, your spouse, your, your parent, parents, right. And how important, in other words, you put in together the pieces of your narrative and you're recognizing that I need to overcome this illness because I am more than just what I'm thinking. And also, I think as a child with trauma, for me to do that to my children, I couldn't do it. So I think that helped me with what I went through as a child, how hard it was. And I think that's what kind of opened my eyes is I was able to see what my 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 son's future would look like. So how, how did your background then as, as a, a writer, you know? Um help you to reflect on all this 
and pull it together? Yeah, so I had at the time, Facebook had like notes and I had a lot of people from college that I knew. I would write like a little blog and it was really helpful to kind of be able to articulate what it felt like in different times of, of the cancer journey. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to kind of compile all of those, um, you know, journal entries and make it into like a little book for my, my sons. And that was helpful for me because when I think when, whenever I write something and I put it on paper, it's like, I'm able to like have it where it kind of comes out and it's no longer, you know, asphyxiating me or something, you know, it was just like, kind of like a thing where I'm able to pour out and also writing all my life. And I forgot to say this before, uh, my therapist, when I was 10 years old, she's the one that introduced me to journaling. Mm. And she's the one that told me that journaling is helpful whenever you're stressed or anxiety or depressed. And when you write it down, that it's actually more manageable. Right. You don't see it as such catastrophic. And so when I was trying to recover from, you know, the second bout with cancer, that really helped me to put it into words yeah. and validate how I felt but also know that I can, I can move on. I can rise up from it. Uh, because when, so you that, write in, when you write in, it causes you to reflect on the bigger picture at times, right? And pull it together. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and you were writing for your child to read. You were writing for your, those who care about you to read and, and, and your followers on Facebook, you said. Yes. Yes. There's the idea of narrative medicine. It suggests that we allow the patient to reflect on their illness, reflect on their journey. And that reflection is, is therapeutic and, and it helps you to, to overcome the challenge that you face. And you experience some of that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And out of all the aspects in my life that were affected, I think the most difficult one that I recently kind of overcame, I guess you can say, mm -hmm. um, is career. So as a very high achieving right. uh, person that I was, uh, overachiever, having not being able to start a career was very difficult. And I went back to teaching and I got burned out and I didn't know what to do. So that was very hard on my, my self-worth mm -hmm. is that I guess my, my grandfather's words, so much intelligence gone to waste. That's, that was something that was haunting me. Right. Yeah. And so I knew I couldn't be a teacher because I didn't have the mental capacity for it because I burned out. So me trying to find a new career path was very difficult. But I think along the way, I've understood that it, it, it wasn't like when you go through something, you don't your moral, your values, you as a human being does not change. Yeah. So if you, if you have a talent for public speaking, or if you have a talent for drawing, like right. no matter what happens, you will always come back to it. Right. Right. And I think that's what helped me understand that no matter if I had a career, in my view, a career, like I was still good at writing. Right. I started a blog with my friend and I would do like different digital ads on Twitter. Like, I guess it helped me see that I'm more than just a job. I'm a person with multiple talents. Your writing experience and your, your, your background and your illness, you're pulling it all together. So it, it made full circle where you, you can use your writing to, to document your writing skills to document your background and um, advocate by sharing. And I actually want to make it a research memoir. Okay. It's, it's where you talk about your life journey, but you bring in different statistics and different, like more, um, right. more knowledge about the subject. Right. And so I'm thinking what I'm going to do is write about every aspect of me, uh, career, family, mm -hmm. intimacy, mm -hmm. and then kind of bring in what other young adults are going through, what policies are being tried, are being put into place, things like that to kind of make it to where you learn about young adult cancer right. survivorship right. through my story. But there's more to it. 
And I was going to ask you what motivated you to do this. I, I know you focus on young adult survivorship. Can you talk about that? Why that focus? So during the pandemic is when, you know, Zoom became something that there's a lot of bad things that came from COVID or things that weren't that great. But one of the best things is the connection through Zoom. So a lot of these cancer organizations that are specific to young adults were able to broaden their resources to more people around the country. And I was able to be part of Grit Health and I was part of their mental health council. Mm -hmm. I was able to do Cactus Cancer. I was able to try like all these different organizations. So I was able to talk to and be in support groups with other young adult survivors. Right. And I noticed that a lot of the things that I was feeling or that I was going through was very similar to them. Right. But I also understood the privilege that I had because when I would talk about my cancer, like survivorship clinic in MD Anderson, I would hear some of them say, I wish I had that. I wish I had that. Mm -hmm. And so I understood my privilege. Yeah. And so I felt like because of that privilege, I think my job is to help make survivorship care available and accessible to everyone. So that was really what started is just listening to other cancer survivors, young adult cancer survivors, and seeing how we have a different, um, different issues that we deal with because we're so young and we still have a full life ahead of us. Yes. And so that's when my advocacy was really, I was inspired by other hearing other people's um, you know, issues with dating or issues. And so that's what started me going and yeah. And people are able to relate to your story, right? You have a whole life story and you overcame struggles and you can see young people who are in there navigating their own life story. Considering person's life context and situation, you're able to relate to and help them to navigate, right? Yeah. And also one thing that I learned during my cancer journey is I remember a friend of mine came to visit me and she had just lost her job. And a lot of times when I had friends come over, you know, visit me in the hospital, they're like, I don't want to bore you with my insignificant problems, yes. you know, because you're dealing with this. But I remember my friend when she lost her job, she was talking about how she felt and it felt exactly the way I felt. And that opened my eyes with loss is loss, mm -hmm. no matter how you experience it. And so that's also another reason why I thought, well, even if I share my story, it won't just affect people with cancer, but also beyond because loss is very, yeah. loss is loss. Yeah. And, and we can connect through that and help each other as a community. Right. So my goal is to bring people together, even if they have different experiences, right. but also to form communities. Right. And Clearly. Illness shaped one's um, life story. And you would say it helps you to develop a way of going forward in life. And, and so the, there are positives that you can pull from an illness experience, right? Yes. Yeah. And also, I will say this. I've actually, I've, I've realized that more other cancer, I mean, other cancer survivors feel the same way where now I know how to set boundaries. Mm. I know how to say no, maybe also because I'm 41, yeah. but I've been able to be more fulfilled in my life because now I'm, I understand that I can say no. Yeah. Like being nice doesn't really mean always doing people pleasing. And so that also has changed because since I, I feel like I don't have time to waste. Yeah. Like I need this promotion. If you can't give it to me, I'll start looking for another job. Right. Right. So that's what I did. I actually have a new job coming up. I'm going to start in September yeah. uh, because it has a better <laughs> shift, better pay, yeah. and I get to work from home. Yeah. And so even though cord blood collecting is very near and dear to my heart, mm -hmm. like I feel like I'm worth moving on. And so that has been very liberating too. And I, and I feel like a lot of other cancer survivors feel the same way. Like I don't have time to waste. Yeah. I, I got to move on. I got to, you know, do something different. And so that's been very, um, it's been, it helps it's been with, awesome. So you're yeah. saying it helps with your career and it gives you that, you know, clarity and, 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 and you know, aware that time is of the essence and nothing is promised. You got to make your decision. How about your relationship with your family then? 
So, although I understand that hurt people hurt people, mm-hmm. um, I've just been kind of just going to the places that make me feel safe. And one of them, one of my happiest places to be is my husband's family. They're not, they're very passive aggressive, but it's not, it's not toxic, at least for me. They're very nurturing. My, I grew up, you know, it was like, okay, you're coming to Christmas. What are you going to make? What are you going to do? And so I always had to be the one to cook or to, but with my in-laws, it's like, no, you just come here. And so I just laid down in my pajamas during Christmas. And then she's like, oh, food's ready. It's going to get cold. And for me, that is something I didn't have as a child. And so like now I'm always with them. Although my mom gets a little jealous and she gets a little upset, but, but I have to explain to her, like, I never had that. And it wasn't, I tell my mom, it wasn't your fault. Those are the cards you were dealt. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate everything. But Tony's, my husband's family, like he, they're very open. Like they're the type of people that if I, like, let's say I rob a bank, they're going to, they're going to say, well, what did, what did, what did you do wrong with her account? Like that type, which is not good as parents growing up, but as a person who was not it was a complete opposite of that and and as an adult have someone completely support you in every little thing you do they don't judge there's a lot of laughter there's like that's where i want to be so those are my safe spaces um and i've been reluctant to go to mexico to visit my grandmother because that's where i dealt with a lot of uncomfortable situations and so i've been able to kind of stay away from that like i don't feel because they're my blood i have to be with them I have to be close to them so now it's like I feel more freedom and I'm just hanging out with the people that I feel enrich me and so that's been very yeah it's it's amazing and and you're saying illness help you to to help to bring clarity to all of this in your life and you're going forward now with this sort of attitude of what's important what makes you happy what makes you successful yes yeah it's Arian, being kind to myself. Sorry, it's no, being kind ahead. to myself. I it was never kind yourself. to myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing, and and I know it, you've had a, a, a difficult childhood to say in one sense, right? And you, your illness is far more difficult than your childhood, but it sharpens your lens, and 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 now you can can look back and 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 see things through a different light and now you're moving forward with life you're optimistic you're you're positive and and you're making a difference and you're advocating for those who are um who are going through these challenges such a, such a rich life such a rich life you've had arian is there yes. anything you thought of you wanted to share before we came on um that we haven't gotten into your story is so rich it swallowed me up and and we have gone places with it. But is there anything you wanted to share that we haven't touched on? You would say no. I think I think this is a good conversation. I think I've said everything for um, you know the topic that we're, we're focusing, focusing on. Yeah, and and we're looking forward to your memoir. And this is just a glimpse into what you have to to say. And all the best in in your writing. Thank you. Your, your Thank you. Of, Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Cultivating Health Equity Stories. Remember, our mission is to amplify voices, challenge norms, and inspire change. Go to CultivateHealthEquity.com, sign up on our email list, subscribe for future episodes, and find the resources mentioned in the show notes. Until next time.